welcome again to Flame of Truth. It's just a blessing that out of all the options uh, going through the skies around our universe, you've somehow found uh, LOBN and Flame of Truth today. I'm Pastor Dan Smith. People call me Pastor Dan. I'm the senior pastor down at the Garden Grove Adventist Church in Orange County. Been there six months, and we're just having fun. And uh, but once in every two or three weeks, I come to LOBN, and we're doing a series on the book of Daniel. Excited about it. We're doing Daniel 2 today. Hopeful to find some new uh, wrinkles for you. But before we get into that, I'd love to have you here. A lovely girl playing the violin, Lindsay Char, with her mother, Marie, accompanying her, playing all to Jesus. Thank you, Lindsay and Marie. Wasn't that special? Thank you for doing that for us. Now we're ready for Daniel 2. I wonder if you're old enough, if you're watching this, to uh, remember the Beatles and, of course, John Lennon, who wrote a very controversial song called Imagine. I won't give you all the lyrics, <laughs> but the gist of it is something like this. Imagine that there's no heaven above us, no hell below us, no religions, no one to die or kill for. You don't have to worry. We can do this by ourselves. We can make life the way it ought to be. We can make the universe and make this world. No countries, no wars, everybody together. He said, you may call me a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. We can do it if we want to. Imagine. There are two worldviews, and that's one of the worldviews that are available is that you can choose to say we're here alone. We don't need a God. We don't need anyone else around us. It's sort of an evolutionary model. We can make our own utopia, our own perfect world. We don't need religions. We can do this by ourselves. It's up to us. And, of course, we have made some progress. And some would say if we could just get a smart enough president and if the Republicans and the Democrats would just stop fighting with each other and work together, we can make this world the way it ought to be and solve our problems. 
and make our own heaven here. There's an old joke that uh, you've probably heard that has the other world view. Four men are flying in an airplane. The plane starts to go down. The captain comes back and says, the plane's going to go down. But there's only three parachutes, but they're mine. I have to have one. He jumps. The next man says, I'm the smartest man in the world, studying the cure for HIV and cancer. I have to have one. He jumps. The next, the old pastor says to the Boy Scout, I've lived a long life. I already know God. You take the last one and you jump. <laughs> and the Boy Scout says, never mind, preacher, the smartest man in the world just jumped with my backpack. And that's the other world do, that we're on the world. We've been flying high for a long time, but eventually this world's going to go down. And there aren't enough parachutes to go around, and so some are going to make it and some are going to crash. And some are going to jump with a parachute, and they're going to go to heaven, and they're going to live forever. The others think that they're jumping with a parachute, but it's really a backpack. And they're going to crash, and they're going to go to hell. But the plane's going down. You have to choose which worldview you want to believe. You may try to find a variation. You may say, I don't want to go either way. But we believe that those are the two worldviews, and you have to choose. Sometimes I've shown a video clip from an old movie called Papillon. I don't agree with the rest of the movie. <laughs> haven't watched most of it. It's too violent for me. But the gist of it is Steve McQueen and uh, Dustin Hoffman, they're down in uh, French Guiana, down in South America somewhere. And they keep escaping from every prison. And uh, every time they get caught, they put them in a worse prison, more secure. They get out of there. Finally, in desperation, they put them on an island in the middle of the ocean, 20 miles away from the coast. It's all cliffs and rocks. No one's ever escaped. They bring a few things once a week, that's all. And so you build a little hut, you have a few chickens, a little garden, and you scratch out an existence the best you can. McQueen won't accept it. He watches the ocean. He figures out that every seventh wave washes away. He says, we can go. They make rafts out of coconuts. They're going to throw them down, jump off the cliff, swim on your raft, raft out from where the rocks are, paddle you back to the coast, and live in freedom. And so they make the rafts. And in the climactic scene, the two old men are standing there on the cliff, ready to go, when Dustin Hoffman says, I'm not going to go. We can't stay here. This is not living. You can't live like this. We can be free. No, I'm going to stay. And the two old men hug goodbye after a lifetime of crying together and escaping. McQueen throws his raft down. He jumps. He swims over, gets on it. The waves wash him out, sure enough. And he paddles and he goes to freedom. And he lives the rest of his life with his family in freedom. Dustin Hoffman goes back to his little hut and his chickens and lives the rest of his life in prison. And it's a metaphor for the cosmic choices we all have to make. Which way are you going to go? Take a chance. You're going to gamble that you can make it and go away and live the rest of for forever with God. Or are you going to stick to what's safe and live in our little hut and prison and chickens and gardens for the rest of our lives? And then that's it. Who are you going to choose? If Jesus has already provided a salvation for us, how can you stay and reject it? Hebrews 2 verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Why does anyone stay on an island like that when there's freedom's already been paid for? But there's always a chance that it might be wrong. Sometimes it's hard not to doubt. Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with him. In Revelation 22, 12. And here we are 2,000 years later. What does soon mean? Maybe it's just all a mistake, and we're going to waste all of our belief, and we're going to may as well wake up and realize this is all there is. There is no heaven and no hell, as John Lennon said, and make this life the best we can and accept it and deal with it. That's the way it is. I wrote an old parable years ago. There was a beautiful young lady who fell in love with the best guy in the high school. They went on to college. At the end of college, they got married. They were magic. They were the perfect guy and the trophy wife and gorgeous and beautiful and alive. People thought this is the best marriage they'd ever seen. After just a little while, he got sick, raced him to the hospital. 
basically died on the table. But they brought the crash card and the code, and they brought him back to life. And they realized they had a second chance. And so they were wonderful together. But after about six weeks in the second life, he said, honey, I've got to go. You know, it's top secret clearance. I can't tell you anything about it. Just I can't tell you when I'm going to come back. I'm coming back right away. Don't worry. I'll be back. Hug goodbye at the door. A few days, no problem. Didn't think it was anything of it. But a little, began to be a week, two weeks, no phone calls, no emails, no nothing. Began to be a little bit concerned. But sure, he would come back. Began to be a few months. She still set the table every day, <laughs> ready for him, kept the house ready. After a few months, people at church began to say, you know, are you sure you haven't heard anything? Oh, he's coming back, I know. He said he'd be back right away. <laughs> you get the idea. After a year, people came to her and just said, you know, maybe, maybe he just, just is gone. Maybe he's died. Maybe he's with someone else. Maybe he has a whole other life on the other side of the planet. Who knows? But you cannot waste the rest of your life waiting for him. Move on. Divorce him. Date. Give yourself a chance. You're young. You're beautiful. Don't let the rest of your life go away waiting for him. No, no, I think he'll come back. Anyway, she lived the rest of her life waiting for him. It seemed cute and quaint for a long time, very sweet, <laughs> but stupid, crazy. Finally, 89, she passed away. Different neighbors came around, church family came to deal with all the stuff in the house, and here was a picture of him on the dresser she'd looked at every day. And there was a little note, don't worry, honey, I'll be back right away. I'll be home soon. I love you forever. Is that where we are? It's cute and it's sweet, but, <laughs> but it's ridiculous to have someone say, I'm coming back soon and I'll come back to get you. And 2,000 years later, we're still waiting. It's a gamble. There's no proof, there's no evidence. No one's come back from heaven. They talk about near-death experiences where people are on the deathbed in the hospital and they, they seem to have an experience where there's light and heaven and music and love coming out of heaven. And then all of a sudden they're back here. But that's not a proof. No one's ever come back to tell us for sure. Every funeral, every grave all over the world that has a cross on it is somebody is gambling. That even though it looks like this is the end, because Jesus Christ died and he rose again, someday there's going to be a resurrection and we'll see our loved ones again. It's a, it's a gamble. I've been reading a little book someone wrote called Liar's Poker. It's about the stock market and trading on the floor. And uh, he talked about this game where these brokers, they love gambling and action risk. And they will have a dollar bill with all the serial numbers and they'll make a gamble and they'll make bets on how many sixes or how many fours. And you have to gamble and see who's bluffing and who's really playing it right. And the owner of this stockbroker company came down onto the floor and challenged the number one player. I'll play you one hand for a million dollars, no tears, which meant you can't complain, you can't whine if you lose. What's the guy going to do? You're a boss, a million dollars. Well, rather than give a, go away from it, he said, no, I'll play you one hand for $10 million, no tears. And the boss walked away, ah, you're crazy. Didn't want to gamble that much. How much are you going to gamble on this to really believe? You go to buy a lottery ticket. You spend a dollar hoping that somehow your ticket is going to be the one that will make you rich forever. What are the odds? Pascal's wager. Famous wager, he says, if there was no other absolute proof for Christianity, I would still believe in Christ. And take a chance, because the upside is so much greater than the downside. If you bet on God and heaven, it turns out it is not true. Just was a mistake. What have you lost? A few days in church singing some nice songs. You put some money into mission projects around the world. You had some good friends. Ah, what have you lost? You had no hangovers, you had no abortions, you lived a good life, faithful to your family. 
But if you gamble that there is no God and there is no heaven and it's all foolishness and you live your life as if there was no God and it turns out you were wrong and there was a God and there was a heaven, you've lost everything. You could have lived forever and you rejected it for whatever you have down here. Pascal's wager said, just on the upside and the downside, I would choose for God, just in case. It's a gamble. Well, I'm going to give you my own testimony today very quickly, why I believe in the second coming. John 14, 1 to 3, you know this passage probably. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that where I am, there you may be also. We're gambling everything on that. That promise is true. It's one of the best pictures of God I know in the Bible. Jesus Christ is saying this the night before he dies. Someone is going to deny him. Someone's going to betray him. All the disciples are going to run away. Some people are going to nail him to the cross. They're going to gamble over his clothes. Some are going to whip him. And yet he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you and come back and take you to be with me. I want you to be with me forever. doesn't matter what they've done. Great picture of God and grace. One of the most powerful arguments for me, the second coming in heaven is C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest Christian apologists of the last hundred years, died uh, in 1963. Anyway, uh, he has this theme in really many of his books, it's what is called the surprised by joy, this longing for joy. And he says that most of us have this nostalgic sense that we came from something, that there's a, there's a mystery place that we have come from that was beautiful and magical and all of our needs were met and we were happy all the time. And we were spending the rest of our life trying to recover that, that mystical place that's just beyond our reach. Once in a while we get a little taste of it on a vacation. And he says, uh, what are the odds that we would have a longing for such a place and for that kind of joy if there was no such thing. All around the world, every culture has the same longing. In Egypt, I've been there with a Middle East tour we took. Hieroglyphics on all these temples, mostly having to do with what will happen to help you have another life. All the guards and, and uh, these boats, these bark, so that they can pass you through to the other world. All the graves and all the gold and all the rest, all one purpose on the other side. I went on a cruise the other day during spring break. Someone had given us, our last church had given us this gift. Had a wonderful time. It's a good idea. You have everything with you. You have shows and you have food. You don't have to prepare. It's all prepared for you. You don't have to drive. You don't have to pack and unpack every night. And it, it's a magical vacation. I know about one lady, sold her house and everything, retired, and just cruises all the time, trying to hold on to the perfect world. And C.S. Lewis says, we have a hunger because there is such a thing as food. We have a desire for sex because there is such a thing as sexuality. We have a longing for this ideal perfect world because there is such a thing. And he became a Christian because of that argument. Is it still coming soon? We've all been embarrassed by preachers who have taken the newspapers and every time something dramatic happened, there it is. Crisis coming soon. There it is. Come down the sawdust trail. And we've all heard every time there was a Middle East war or some other crisis in the world. And we've been embarrassed. I believe many of the signs, all the earthquakes, look what's going on in our world today. China, Chile, Haiti, right here not too far from us in California. Newspaper article today said more, are more earthquakes this year than the years in the past. What's going on? But if you really ask me the signs that really matter to me, number one is the cross of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died in our place. Why would he go through that if he wasn't going to come back and finish the job? The whole purpose of the cross was to come back and have us be with him, that where I am, there you may be also. Every morning the sun comes up is a sign we're one day closer to the second coming. Every birthday, I have a birthday coming in a couple weeks. Every birthday, one year closer to when I will jump to the head of the line and face my destiny. And, have, and Christ will come for me in that sense. And when you die, you fix your choices. The earthquakes, disasters around the world, fundamentalism, the whole movement of fundamentalism around the world, 
The idea that if I can't persuade you to live by my beliefs and what I think is best, I will use the police and the laws and the government to force you to believe. And Revelation 13 says, that is the beast power. If I can't get you to do it, I will force you to worship according to the first beast, is what the Bible says, is a sign of the last days. But of course, of course, the ultimate, the ultimate sign of the last days is the gospel going to all the world. Matthew 24, 14 says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And while we've talked about that for a long time, my parents were missionaries. I go speak all over the world. But we have the capacity to spend the gospel, spread the gospel here at LLBN. Satellites all over the world now. We have satellites. We have the Internet. We have uh, Facebook and Skype and Twittering. So many new ways to spread the gospel. And then the talk shows where one or two or three or five people have massive audiences. And if they care about a particular subject, they can put that subject in play and the whole world will know about it very quickly. We just need the right series of circumstances. And so I believe he's coming soon because of the signs. Well, let's get now to Daniel chapter 2 very quickly. You know the passage, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He can't remember the dream or the meaning. He calls for all his wise men, basically astrologers and uh, the occult. Tell me the dream and tell me the meaning. No, we can't tell you that. You tell us the dream, we'll tell you the meaning. No, I can't. I, no one can do that. That's only to the gods can do that. Well, now that's true. I want all of you to die. The word goes out to uh, all the wise men, which includes Daniel and his friends who were Jews here in Babylon to be trained to be part of their wise men. And Daniel says, can we have a little time? <laughs> and knock on the door. Have you ever felt the power of a knock on the door like that? And all of a sudden, fear just goes through every cell of your body. Cancer report. Lost a job. Been laid off. Bad grades at school. Lost a game at school. Some, some problem that just scares you to death. A knock on the door. What do you do when there's a knock on the door and you're scared? Daniel and his friends pray. They went to God. Where do you go when you're under pressure, when it feels like someone's going to take your head off like Daniel? Where do you go? Daniel goes to God. Not alcohol, not sex, not drugs, not money, not talk shows, not the dudes in the dorm rooms down the hall. We go to God. And they go as a group. They prayed as a group. You need a group. You need a church. You need a small group, a community in your life. They get the dream. Daniel walks in before the king. Do you have the dream? Are you able? Not me, but Daniel 2.28. There is a God who is in heaven, and he is able to tell you what it is. Daniel is saying, you thought, you thought uh, your gods beat our gods. You came over to Jerusalem, destroyed our temple. But this dream will tell you that our gods are better than your gods. Your gods cannot tell you the dream or the meaning, but we are going to tell you the dream because we have a God in heaven. Thou, O king, you saw in a great image, Daniel 2, and the head was made of gold. And he said, Thou art this head of gold. And so we have the empire, the world empires. Everyone agrees with this. Babylon, 605, 538 to 539. And after you, another kingdom shall rise, inferior to you, Medo-Persia. It won't take a long time with that, 539 and down to 331 maybe. Next one, belly and thighs of brass or bronze. Everyone believes that's probably Alexander the Great and the whole empire of Greece, 331 to maybe 168 B.C. And then the legs of iron, everyone says that's Rome. Very powerful, 168 down into the 400s after Christ when these tribes begin to come. And then the to to ten toes, iron and clay, Countries of Europe, some strong, some weak. And then the famous verse, Daniel 2, 43, they shall not cleave one to another. Amazing passage. Eight, empire, eight emperors at least tried to put all of Europe together. Have every one of them failed. All it took is to disprove God in the Bible. One of those to find a way to put Europe together. Still hasn't happened. And then he says there will be a stone cut out without hands that is going to come down and going to smash that image into pieces and will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed and a mountain will fill the whole earth. 
And we've all learned that that was a sign of the second coming. Christ is the stone, and he will come and set up a kingdom. Babylon and all these powers that are over you and me today will not rule forever. And if you're poor today, you will not always be poor. There will be a mansion someday. If you're struggling or sick or suffering, you will not suffer forever. The Babylons are going to be destroyed, and Christ will set up his kingdom. Well, before we're done, we have to go a little farther. Angel came to Mary, mother of Jesus, and said, you're going to have a son, and your son is going to be the one, and his house is going to reign forever, and his kingdom will never end. In Luke chapter 1, direct quote from Daniel, and he was saying, your son is going to be the one, the Messiah who was going to set up a kingdom. And so we believe the stone doesn't just start at Daniel 2. The stone already begins here at the first coming of Christ. Jesus said, the kingdom is in the midst of you. The kingdom is already here. The accuser of his brethren has already been cast down, Revelation 12 says, verse 10 to 12. Kingdom is already here. Christ's reality. The world is already different. The stone began, Christ. And then he rose from the grave. He said, I have the keys of death and hell. It's already here. Easter, we've already done Easter a couple weeks ago. Christ has come. The reality is here. The world is different. And the stone began with one, and then three disciples, and then 12, and then 70, and then 500, then 3,000, 5,000, and now 2.3 billion Christians. Are you part of the stone today? I've been to uh, D-Day Normandy beaches there in France where our armies and navies came, parachuters, had to fight their way, D-Day. But the German armies were reeling from that time until they ended up in Berlin, V-Day, when they had Victory Day. And that's where we are today. Christ came and died and rose from the grave as D-Day, the hammer blow against Satan. Kingdom has already begun. The stone began. One of these days we're going to have V-Day and Christ's victory will go all over the world. But you and I already are part of the stone. We are already living a new reality. That is the power. We have picked the winning ticket. We have not made a mistake. Don't be sorry. We stand with Christ. God bless you all.